Pick your thing and do it right. That is the key to success for so many different games, especially in a world where we see things are a little bit bloated, right? What used to be rambling around the Middle East as Altair or whatever, a small number of mechanics, and then Ezio then turned into infinite open world with a million things on the map. Horizon Zero Dawn, all these great games, but man, they do have a lot going on. Yeah. And recently, we've seen some games that are just beautiful examples of, keep it simple, focus on the craft, give the people what they want. In a way, you could say, bit of a safe bet. In another way, execute something that somebody would absolutely find a lot of joy in excellently, and there's a good chance you'll find success. Another game that pops into my head is uh, Kana. Uh, bridge oh, yeah. of uh, bridge of spirits but today we're talking about stray and multiverses uh two of the latest games to absolutely explode yeah and they're very different games you kind of wonder how do you get kind of both of these under the same breath outside of the fact that they're successful at the same time but i think it's interesting because they both fall under the umbrella of well here's a clear demographic here's a clear I don't want to say target audience and make it sound like it's super focused on like the marketability of it but it's like here's a game you play as a cat you go around a cyberpunk area who's not going to well i mean people might not be super into that but that's clearly has an audience people clearly go hell yeah i want that absolutely and that was obvious as soon as it was like re revealed a any form of marketing was just completely free wins and then with multiverses you're like well you know maybe you go well the warner brothers uh, ip maybe not super super strong among the general gaming stuff outside of maybe you think the like shadow Morgan games stuff but then you go well here's a smash game made by people who love smash and it's free to play which is its own kind of downside but it has everyone playing it obviously and it's made by people who love smash and it's not just on the switch you can play it on pc for example and you're, oh, that's obvious yeah and you can see it's obvious because so many other places have tried it there's the brawl hollow which is, does pretty well there's rivals of ether which is like a super dedicated smash community kind of uh, version of that and then there's the Nick All-Star Battle Brawl, which yeah, bit, didn't, didn't do as yeah, well. a bit scuffed. And then you look at like you look at multiverse, you go, well, it's clearly the ideas there and the executions there because the team clearly love it, love it and know what they're doing. Yeah, and a similar example in a very different genre has got to be Power Lives, right? Yeah. Where the, you know loves the Sims, but it's not like EA's <laughs> always giving you the best. And then you look at Power Lives and you're like, holy. I mean, this is bound to be a winner. So mm -hmm. take a look then. I mean, Stray. What, like, you have such an insane, I mean, we love score multipliers in games, right? The marketing score multiplier that you have in Stray, because you don't have to pay someone to retweet that. They're going to because it's adorable. And it's made by ex Ubisoft Montpellier staff. Uh, started off in 2015. It was originally called uh, Cat Adventure Game. <laughs> I think HK, because. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously. Yep. Um, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, that was basically it. Platforming, some basic stuff. You're a cat in the city. Now it's ended up, uh, well, now it's ended up being pretty much the top of Steam and the best user-reviewed game of 2022. Elden Ring also came out this year. Yeah, that's really crazy. Obviously, Elden Ring had its technical issues and obviously is a bit more divisive as far as the game's concerned. But to even like win that kind of title against God of War, which is by so many concerns like one of the best games ever made, like as a you know as the, at a population level would suggest something like that, and Strange is like no nah, game but a cat, like well clearly that goes to show that the concept, the fantasy, the heart of what you're experiencing, can be so much more important than even like higher quality, because obviously it's high enough quality, but it kind of offsets that and just goes yeah well, it's a cat game, of course yeah, and I think what's fascinating here is. It's the sort of thing, like, not to say this is a small indie, absolutely not. Of course not, yeah. Um, but modern tech allows a smaller team to go a hell of a lot further. Hmm. So what they're able to achieve on its own is pretty damn impressive. And because at the time I'd lost my PS5 controller, I played the <laughs> PS4 version. Christ. And even still, it was a pretty damn impressive experience. Hmm. So they can punch above their weight going for a clear style and fantasy niche that it's, it's a bit like that. It's a quote from uh, Mythic Quest about like great sci-fi. <laughs> it's got to be unexpected, but feel inevitable. Mm. And that's exactly what it is with a game like this. You didn't, we didn't expect to see this game, but once we see it, it's almost inevitable that it'll do well. Yeah, it's complete hindsight. Like, oh my God, how is this the first thing to do this? How has no one done this before to this level? 
and it just kind of is that marriage of like you know the devs were interested they have the idea and then we're capable of doing it yeah and this is probably a more niche thing but for um annapurna oh, yeah. i think a lot of their core audience is a bit like a24 when you move over to film, right? The people who like A24 films, generally they're going to really, really follow that label. I think similar with Annapurna. Yes, 12 minutes maybe was a little bit disappointing uh, to some, but generally they've had a pretty damn strong track record. And uh, it's one that this game is absolutely blown up through. Another thing that's bound to help too is uh, some of the mods, right? Like the Spyro <laughs> mod. I mean, yeah. that thing's actually went tremendous, giving a massive amount uh, of free marketing and then free marketing that anyone with PlayStation Plus can just go get the game, which is exa exactly what I did. I haven't paid for Stray. Yeah. I just got it in PS Plus. Yeah, that's one of the crazy things to think about Stray. It's like, you obviously we have our kind of doubts about the extreme long term of the PS Plus and Game Pass model for like game valuation stuff. And it's, hey, here's a brand new game. You get it for, you know, here get, up the, get the free trial. Because that was what they really did super well. They were like, here's a free trial to the big tier of PS Plus. You can get Stray, the game everyone's talking about. But in that case, it's like, if Sony and Microsoft are sitting there throwing big piles of money at developers to make things like this happen, and then they benefit from the you know all the stuff on their platform, and they're now fighting each other over it, then that's just great publicity for everyone. And obviously, the devaluation wasn't super there because so many people bought it on PC as well. Yeah, absolutely. So really, it's just everything coming together. And then I think a very important thing, which is not biting off more than they can chew, because this is almost like with Kenna, I suppose. It's a shorter game with a lower price point, And what they've evidently focused on is complete, just brilliant execution of what they've got. And certainly in Stray, the attention to detail, I think anybody who has had a cat, anyone who knows like how cats behave, can read their body language, etc., will know just how goddamn authentic the, uh, I mean, obviously cats probably aren't going to be, you know, going around with their robot friend knowing what to do. But other than that, pretty damn authentic, right? So all of that's done brilliantly. And now Stray, a single player game that is four and a half hours long had over 50 and a half thousand concurrent players on Steam. That's just incredible. 12 minutes, which did extremely well with its marketing side. I uh, you know a lot of people were talking about it, interested in it. I think uh, it did have a little bit more of a mixed reception uh, compared to something like Stray. It had 8,000. Outer Wilds, which again is an absolutely outstanding game, uh, around 8,000 as well. So like for Annapurna, this is an absolutely human humongous, a uh, humongous performer that has had incredibly strong reviews. So this is like one example of evident appeal executed marvelously. However, with Stray, I think it's a little bit more in a inevitable that it would succeed, obviously not to discount the hard work, um, but also unexpected. A game though that is a little bit different from that is Multiverses. Because... Yeah. It is very much a pretty exact game format. Yeah, it's like so obvious to anyone who looks. It's like, yeah, of course that's of course that's a Smash game. They have in there the like the Smash control scheme. It's under Legacy. They've got their own control scheme. <laughs> yeah, they know. And what's they up. actually, they, you know, they have very much went and got like iterations on the genre, like the tethering stuff and a whole bunch of different mechanics. You know, what Connor was telling me, it's very very different, but it's obviously there for people. Maybe it's got a little bit more mechanical depth for the kind of pro side of things. Really? A little bit, just a little bit. Okay, wow. Because uh, obviously Smash is a little bit more simple mechanical, but there's more depth in that simplicity. But they had, because um, I remember seeing like the Nick one and going, well, that seems okay, that's fine. You know, playing a little bit of Brawlhalla, playing some Rivals, going, okay, these are all like Smash likes, but they don't have the same appeal. They don't have the same aesthetic, they don't have the same like IP draw for people. And then I saw, I can't remember who it was, but it was two of the like more modern Smash pros were invited to a developer like kind of interview with them and it was devs versus pros and they had this whole like unedited thing and like a little edited down version of hey here's literally smash players we're not going to say the word smash at any point in this video but you all know what we're here for you all know what this is and then they were like this is this is great the developers have been talking to us about what they're doing we we love where it's at we love where it's going to go and then that like gameplay was just so much of the the kind of the reverence for the IP as well. Because looking at like footage and stuff and hearing how they describe it where you have really classic stuff to like, you know, you've got your Bugs Bunny, you've got your Superman, you've got your 
Scooby-Doo, very shaggy with the Ultra Instinct stuff, which is leaning in on like cultural memes and stuff, so they clearly know what they're talking about. Or the devs are like, yeah, we're going to make this for an actually modern audience and put our kind of heart and soul in. And it can feel a little bit reductive to go, ah, it's Smash for different IP. But it's definitely like, it's so obvious. Like you're saying, it's unexpected. Mm. You weren't expecting anyone to do it. But when you do it, you're like, why, yeah. did, why, why did no one else try this? And uh, they did, but they didn't do it. Another side of it too. Hmm. I think about the mod, right? Mm. Smash mod. Was it Pro Project M? Yeah, Project M. Yeah. And just like Zeno was saying, hey, Evo, can't do that <laughs> or else we're pulling out. Yeah. So also this is, <laughs> okay, I don't want to say that like what people want is for this style of game to be unshackled from Nintendo doing what Nintendo do. Yeah. But also it is this style of game unshackled from Nintendo and some of their annoying things, which certainly for maybe, I don't know if this is going to be more appealing game to people who love Smash, love Project M. Maybe hard to know. But ah, there's just a bit more competition, right? You know, a bit more competition. And I think that's just healthy, uh, healthy for the scene. Yeah. I mean, and it's not Plus, like, like yeah. I can do it in PC or anything else. Yep. Like that's big. Yeah, that's a really massive thing as opposed to like, you know, if you're playing melee and going through emulation and using like Project Slippery or something like that, or uh, I can't remember the Smash Sports, the online ladder. But there's even, like they're even throwing a tournament at EVO, not literally at EVO, but like alongside EVO at the same time in Mandalay Bay, they've got a $100,000 total payout tournament for that. And you're thinking, holy shit, that's, that's a lot of money they're putting in f to make this game kind of pop. And then you look at what Nintendo are doing, they're like, oh, yeah, they're not giving anyone any money whatsoever. Maybe maybe a couple of thousand here and there, but that comes with massive asterisks. And like, well, now you've got like some people who have the same game. They know what the player wants. And I think that's what the important part of this is. They know what the player like fantasy and what the heart of this game is. It's that kind of kind of party ish, but with like the, the fighting game aspect to it as well. And then, but with actual support, with actual support and even like pretty quick balance patches because even they announced recently the whole big like post evo balance patch because obviously you're not going to patch just before a tournament whereas honestly nintendo might, might have done that <laughs> i think they've done that before but there's like yeah here's here's all the balance changes from for the beta we've got this well supported we plan on bringing this for like ages almost in the same way like like the comparison between in terms of like popular ip there's a comparison between fortnite here as well where it's like you just fire all the ip in the world because warner bros owns so much so yeah, just have whatever the hell you want in this and it'll do absolutely fine. Yeah, and the gameplay peak is 150k. That's a lot. Just on like, Steam. Obviously, you know, obviously, well, it's free to play, of course, so there's no, like, risk to downloading and playing it, but even then, it's like, as soon as you have that reputation of, oh, do you like Smash, but you want, like, a modern Smash that's on PC as opposed to, you know, stuck on the Switch, which obviously is a great platform and stuff, but there's a lot of difference, a lot of kind of different audience here that are completely, completely uncatered for. And uh, they are. Yeah, so it's People just... People want it. Lower that barrier to entry. Yeah. And I suppose for somebody like me, it... I mean, there's no cost, right? Like, I've played Smash a few times. I enjoy Smash. I'm awful at Smash. I can just grab this free-to-play. And, you know, maybe yeah. I'll get hooked. Right? Which is a pretty damn humongous strength. Of course, this is not to say that it's a simple game, right? So you've got characters and different archetypes, which we would expect. There's a uh, whole thing about tethering, hmm. right? To basically avoid knockouts. Yeah. Seems like it could create some really cool plays and like, I guess, big exciting moments. Yeah, uh, An elemental damage system, hmm. you know, just to add some more in. And also punishment for spamming the same move over and over, which is kind of funny because I remember playing uh, Marth against you mm -hmm. and I worked out that his sprint B, yeah. you know, the one where it's like a red slash. Yeah. I kind of worked out that was like, uh, it was like the noob tube <laughs> of, of that game. So uh, I suppose nice to know that I would be punished. Yeah, that's the thing where it's like, it's those things that you, because you're a new property in a new game, you can be a clone, but you can also kind of innovate in a, in a nice way. And that's what they're kind of doing here with the team mechanic stuff. You're like, yeah, of course. There, that's one of the things that's kind of been a little bit annoying about Smash is it becomes very much a free-for-all and there's not really much to support a team outside of like being there. So obviously there's there's fine gameplay by default in, in being, you know, 2v2 or whatever. But now they're like kind of, no, what can we add? Because they obviously love Smash to pieces. What can we add that makes that feel more meaningful to play in a team? Tethering. So you can, you know, you can save someone if they're about to go off. 
and that's like a really cool little change and then the obviously one of the biggest problems with smash is people learn the things that are easy to do and then that gets kind of annoying for especially like i guess especially like worse players like newer players you just kind of run into a wall that you can't beat they're like yeah here you go here's the punishment here's just there's the the mechanical way to make it more engaging and more enjoyable for them it's crazy yeah now the only side that is getting uh, maybe a, a little bit more i guess criticism is just yeah. the microtransactions where currently it's 255 bucks to unlock everything um mm. i mean that said though like it's a kind of a weird thing right because you know you look at like a league of legends mm. and people generally will say the league of legends feels pretty fair yeah that's a free to play so in a world where this is free to play and you just hop in and and go and I, I think it's really just skins. Yeah. But I suppose it's, yeah, it could hit kids or whatever. So, I mean, they should have the appropriate controls in there. Doesn't seem mega bad to me. I guess it's like, is the intent that somebody will, you know, maybe this should have been a $40 game and now it's going to be a $255 game. Or is it more just get some stuff for a few characters that you like? Yeah, I think that really comes down to that where you can see that it's 255 to unlock everything. And you go, well, that's a bit, you know, that's definitely bad if you were to assume this, you know, in the comparison of you play like Smash Melee and obviously you didn't really have like character skins and stuff, but all the other characters, you all unlocked everything. Everything in the whole game was back in the good old days before, you know, microtransactions existed. And that's kind of against this. It's like, hey, this is more traditional kind of modern free to play monetization. But it's like, it's kind of hard to be mad at that when there's so much worse going on, I think. Yeah, I think yeah. that's kind of most of the most of the problem. Where, well, it's uh, I hate saying it, but it's kind of like they probably needed that for the game to exist in the first place, which is just a sort of sad truth, I think. But as long as they aren't doing anything particularly predatory, and you can earn stuff while playing, then that's fine. Yeah, I think the other side too is uh, this really comes out at a bad time for Nickelodeon. Yep, because they're coming Absolutely. out with not as good of a game and it costs 40 quid yeah well that's the that's the fun thing right because it, until i saw that actual devs versus pros thing for a multiverses i was just thinking oh it's just another one of these kind of cash grab things because i wouldn't trust warner brothers as far as i could throw them yes and they're a corporation so i physically can't throw them whatsoever so i wouldn't trust them in the slightest amount with any of their properties but then i saw the devs versus pros and I saw how the developers were talking. And then you see, like, uh, it's a lot of, like, the stage outs and stuff are themed specifically for characters. And you can tell it's, like, that was... I don't know how they worked it out. But they clearly had the developers sit with, like, the, the suits that were, like, you know, how much is this project going to cost? How much can we expect back? How long will it take? And they managed to work out a way to say, we're going to fill this game full of unique flavor that really supports all of your IP, all of your characters... And we're going to put the love in so players actually, you know, enjoy it and get to get to see that full experience. And it's all really like unique stuff. And even from like, I think there might be some IP that's in the game but not playable, which would, you know, you would assume if you get to an IP secured, you'd want a playable character in there. But they're going, no, no, we'll just have a little bit of flavor. We'll do all of the paperwork we require, all of the discussions with teams to just get this really authentic bit in. And obviously they would have to go and communicate with the divisions who own the IP to go, okay, so can we get the assets for, say, say the Steven Universe stuff? Can we get the right assets for that? Or can we get something? And they're putting all that effort in. And that's like, okay, well, maybe from the Warner Brothers Suits perspective, this is a cash grab. And they just go, that's a money-making project, free-to-play, whatever. But from the developers, they clearly are like, no, we've put our heart and soul in this. And they've found a way to do it really well. Whereas the Nick one just looks, oh, it's... Forty dollars or forty quid, sixty dollars upright or right front. You're like, and it's not really good. Doesn't really have the same soul. Doesn't have all the playable characters you'd expect. And you go, well, maybe no harm to the devs who are working on it, but that probably ended up being more of a cash grab project. Yeah. Whereas yeah. this one is very clearly not. Well, it's also being, it's got it's got the heart and soul of what people expect from Smash in it, what players want from that that fantasy and that experience. But also it's a little bit different and also on PC so you can play it there yeah, the, and also free. The, the timings are also weird though. Like it is a bit yeah. of an Armageddon Deep Impact situation where it's yeah. like, well, these are very similar games coming out at a similar time. Mm -hmm. I'm a bit sad because uh, I like to play Korra, but I think <laughs> the, the game that's going to take off You have to play the is, Platinum Games one, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, it is maybe not the one that has got the, uh, the Avatar characters. Hmm. 
So there you go. Games that have basically had that big lightning strike of success. And we've talked about a few of those recently. Power washing sim, house flipping sim. Mm. It's just neat when you see what can actually make it so high in Steam. And it's actually, I mean, obviously Multiverses is a big AAA game, yeah. but that just it feels like there's a lot of variety, right? There's a lot of unique, cool stuff getting out there. Yeah, and a lot of it is like, because obviously this is kind of framed in comparison to what we talked about recently with Ubisoft. Yeah, and very with, much so. And um, with the Creative Assembly game, where you kind of look and go, who's this for? Who did you make this for? Did you, you know, clearly there was some creativity involved in like the kind of, in the individual elements, but the whole product just feels a little bit like kind of put together for no good particular reason. They didn't really stop and go, you know, we have the vision of like a person in mind who will love this mm. and there's like maybe 10, 100,000 of these people out there. So we'll make that and we'll really kind of give it our all. And that's what we're seeing finally find success here. We're seeing those games that are like, hey, this is a cat game. Hey, this is Smash, but different IP and on PC. Hey, this is a game where you power wash some stuff. Here's you sell a house. You know, in your earlier example of Paralyzed, of just, here's the Sims, but not EA. And you're like, that's the stuff that's actually, and it is frustrating that most of this is like very heavy on PC, but you even see stuff like Stray and straight up on PS Plus, and it's like, oh, same with Game Pass and it getting Vampire Survivors pretty quickly and Power Wash Sim at launch. And you're like, oh, yes, finally, the platforms know now. The platforms are fully aware they need these things to be really good and really well marketed, which is so far away from like, and no harm to any of the games there because most of them are kind of okay. They're just not major. But like the early days of PS Plus, sure, the indie scene was a little bit weaker back mm -hmm. in like the maybe 2013, 2014 and the like early PS4 stuff. And they started to give out the the three the three PS4 games, and a lot of them are like very cheap, very kind of put together by full indies, and not really marketed very well, not really super. Just kind of just make a game for the sake of it in a kind of way, and that was what the they were doing, going almost a tick a box of indie game tick box, indie game tick box. There are plat or our people will be help will be happy, because no one seemed to think about it from any sense of the player fantasy or the experience or the heart or soul of any of that. They just kind of did it, but now it's becoming like a thing they're thinking about. They're going, well, what, what unique experience can we actually bring to our players? And not just what smoke and mirrors can we spend $200 million on a game to, to make them enjoy? Which, I mean, that's a, that's a little bit unfair to the really good big games. Well, you think about it, it's still like something, that, natural, like, something natural, evidently, yeah, it's coalesces, like, yeah. right? Like, there's, there's a reason why this all does better than... Ghost Recon Frontlines. I might have invoked some ire by saying this, but you know what it feels like? It feels like maybe the last 10 years or so was a little bit PS1 era, or maybe even a little bit like late 80s or maybe even early 80s, where there were a lot of creative games, but none of them were particularly super well executed. Maybe you got lucky sometimes and they kind of were. And that's what I think that's what the whole PS1 kind of generation was for at least for for me kind of playing stuff was like, well, this is a good idea, but it's not really done very well. Or this is kind of just shot out in a, like clearly a couple months for no good reason. But then you get into like the PS2 era and you see developers kind of get a hold of themselves. and go, OK, well, we have more more creativity, more resources, more ability to execute. And then they get to do that more. And then you get like the really like the, some of the stuff out of there was like super, super creative, but they're also full games. As opposed to vaguely action platformy 2D, or like the days of you know like a Batman 2D game on SNES or whatever else, we kind of feel like we're hitting like the indie PS2 gen, which means we're about to have some really really cool stuff and well executed, although hopefully at higher frame rates on average. <laughs> well, yeah, I feel, I feel like it's just people like the tools have got so good, people have yeah. got their reps in. Yeah, it's exactly that. It's yeah. There's a lot yeah. of basically there's a lot of really impressive stuff uh, I think yet to come. Yeah. And what just yeah, like what indies can do, what smaller teams can do. I mean, yeah, like it's even a, it's a pretty exciting time. Even looking at Annapurna, like you could you may not be a fan of Neon White style, but it's a hell of a good game. Yeah. And then e Neon White not that long ago, and then Stray comes out, and you're like, that's that's the kind of publisher that's going. Hey, we we have a good eye for what people want. Whereas Devolver do that really really well in the kind of more gameplay oriented thing. New Blood do that for like the boomer shooter kind of revamp and a partner sitting here going we know the game is like maybe not super frenetic maybe not super action oriented 
but it's got a good narrative or kind of that enjoyable overall couple of our experience. And there's a load of these small publishers have like their niche that's really good and is starting to kind of prove. Maybe they're no longer publishing two-man indie teams. Maybe they're publishing a six-man ex-triple-A indie team. And that's where you're going to see some of the best stuff ever created. Yeah, the just the industry maturing. Yeah. Very, very interesting. We're Hey, it's a big ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So it's fun to see it develop. And uh, we get to reap the rewards of that as gamers, which is great and why you should feel pretty damn good, actually, about this hobby. So sure. there we go. Great games. Check them out. If you have games that kind of meet these criteria for yourself, let us know. With Absolutely. that said, we'll see you next time.